Welcome into Hitting Hard with John Chuckery. Today on the show, Athens will be the center of the college football universe come Saturday. Falcons have a good problem coming up this weekend, and the Falcons will also start getting more of their weapons involved. All next, Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked on Sports Atlanta. This is Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, and it starts now. Hitting Hard is brought to you by Bet Online. Head to YouTube.com, put Locked On Sports Atlanta into your search browser. When you get to our page, hit that subscribe button, leave us a comment. We are free and available on all of your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify and Odyssey. Download us, leave us a five-star review. Roku and Amazon Fire. Yes, you can find us there now. Hit us up there, leave us a review. And of course, at JMCH316 on my personal Twitter page. Well, coming up on Saturday afternoon, the college football universe will be centered around Athens, Georgia. Of course, game day going to game day, excuse me, going to be there. Obviously, Tennessee in Georgia doesn't really matter if it's one, two, one, three, what have you like that. You know, it's not just going to be the game itself. And I've been, you know, doing some radio hits and talking about this. Think about the emotion in that stadium come Saturday because this is going to be the first chance for the Georgia brethren to gather and honor and tribute Vince Dooley, who died last Friday, all right? They were in, obviously, you know, Jacksonville to take on Florida for the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. So this will be the first chance at home to celebrate the life and legacy. So you add all of that, plus two of the top teams in the country. And oh, by the way, the winner of this game is pretty much guaranteed that they're going to be in the SEC championship game, with all due respect. Georgia's not losing to Kentucky. Georgia's not losing to Mississippi State. And Tennessee's not losing to what they got, Missouri, Vanderbilt, and South Carolina. They're not losing to those teams, okay? I mean, so the winner of this game is going to represent the SEC East. But it's awesome to have such a great environment this late in the season for all the marbles on the line. You know, there's been a couple of times over the last couple of years about the Georgia-Florida game, but... Let's be honest. I mean, that game hasn't meant nearly as much, but this is the center of the universe this weekend. And a couple of thoughts. One is Nolan Smith is now out for the year for Georgia. Got a torn pec muscle. So we got that news this morning. That's going to hurt. You want guys that be are able to put pressure on Hendon Hooker. One of the things that Georgia has to do early in this game, and they gave up some big plays to Florida, but Tennessee comes in, and they treat you like a Mike Tyson fight. They come in and throw haymaker after haymaker after haymaker early. They don't just kind of get their feet underneath them. They don't kind of just jab you, and they don't just kind of get themselves ready. They come out up-tempo, huck it downfield, get big chunks of plays, and hit you hard early on and see if they can knock you out early in that game. They got up quick on Florida, got up quick on LSU, got up quick on Alabama got up quick on ten or uh, Kentucky last weekend. That's their formula. Now, look, Tennessee realistically hasn't had to go on the road for these big games, right? That game against Alabama was in Knoxville. Last week against Kentucky, the Florida game. So they haven't had to go on the road and take on one of these top teams yet. So it's going to be a different environment because they ain't going to have the home crowd sitting right behind them. And I think the Georgia faithful are coming out in full strong force because, as I said, it's not just the game itself, but this is going to celebrate and honor Vince Dooley and his legacy. And I'm sure there'll be other things that they will do throughout the year, but this will be the first chance to ramp up that emotion. And Kirby Smart called out the crowd just saying that, hey, look, we need you to be louder than you've ever been on Saturday. If you can talk after the game, you weren't loud enough. So besides weathering the storm early, I think Georgia has to run the football effectively in this game. Look, Tennessee is a top 10 rushing defense in the country, but I think that there is fool's gold with all of that. They haven't had a lot of teams that really want to establish the run. And besides that, as they get up on you, like the LSU game, you know, LSU wants to run the football, but when you're down two or three touchdowns early in that game, it's tough in college football 
to want to be committed to the run. Georgia is such a balanced offense, top 10 running team, top 10 passing team, that they can they can find themselves, they get down a bit, they can still run and come back, right? They can do some different things unlike any offense that Tennessee has seen. But I think Georgia is going to come out and really try to establish their line of scrimmage, establish their running game, and try to keep that Tennessee offense off the field. Look, Tennessee offensively doesn't care about time of possession. So this is not about trying to, you know, limit how long Tennessee's on the field or any other. It's about reducing the amount of possessions that Tennessee has. If I can knock down a couple of possessions in the first half against Tennessee, that's two less times they have a shot to try to score a touchdown or go make a big play. And Cedric Tillman coming back was a big deal for Tennessee. He's an all-conference caliber wide receiver. Now he gets back in the mix. He made some plays on Saturday in the Kentucky game for him. I think this is going to be a whale of a game. And I really do think that the biggest thing that I am looking for first and foremost is the Georgia running game against the Tennessee defense because they've been good and they give up less than 100 yards, but they haven't had a team that wants to stay committed and continue to run the football against them. Once you get down, tough to want to stay with that formula and that game plan, and you have to open it up a little bit because they're so quick, they're so up-tempo. And these are obviously, look, Tennessee, I think, is the number one scoring offense in the country. Georgia's in the top 10 in scoring in the country. They both average over 40 points a game. Tennessee's just, they were 50 going into last week, but step back to whatever it is, 48, 49 points a game. Georgia's over 40. We've seen the evolution of their offense. But I think they have enough confidence in Stetson Bennett. And I know he made a couple of bad mistakes in that Florida game. I don't think they want to have to come out and try to throw it early on. I think they want to establish their run. You remember that final drive, that final touchdown drive for Georgia in the Florida game. It was just line up and come right at you. Mixing McIntosh and those guys and come right at you, right? And Kirby said, you know, after that touchdown that he went over and told McIntosh, he's a bad MFer, right? So the Nolan Smith injury really hurts. But Kirby is very confident that his defensive backs, Christopher Smith and Ringo and those guys, um, he feels like that they can match up because look, Hyatt to him, they got a lot of weapons on Tennessee, but he feels pretty confident. Where I'd love to see Nolan Smith is obviously just getting upfield, getting pressure on Hendon Hooker. And the line opened up. The futures line originally on this game was around 12. That was about 10 and a half, 11 a couple of days ago. Then the Sharps have gotten in. And they've gotten that thing down to about eight, eight and a half right now. And that's about where the line is probably going to stay because we haven't seen Tennessee be tested on the road yet the way that they will this weekend. So I'm super excited about this game. I do think Georgia finds a way to win this weekend. Covering, eh, I'm not I'm not convinced about eight, eight and a half that they cover that line because I think this is going to be about, look, if, if Georgia or Tennessee feels like they can get three or four stops, right? If I can get three or four stops in the game, I give my offense a real chance. Because I think Georgia's, Georgia feels like, look, they can run it, they can throw it, they can get Bowers involved, they can get McIntosh in the running game going. They feel like that they can be balanced enough that they don't have to get panicked and get out of what they do best. So Athens is going to be a blast on Saturday. This is going to be, I think, one of another great college football games that we've seen this season. All right, you interested in the action? You heard the eight, eight and a half. Want to talk about my friends over at Bet Online? Listen, BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your sports wagering information. Look, very simple. Take the mobile device, head to BetOnline.net today. You think that Georgia can cover that line? Put some money on it. You think Tennessee is going to roll? Put some money on it. You got NBA every night. Hawks are still on the road. World Series gets cranked back up tonight, right? They had a rain delay. You're in the epicenter of the sports universe right now. Head to betonline.net today. Check out all their news, their information, podcast news, stats, scores, everything that you need to be a smarter sports better is available at betonline.net. So take the mobile device, head to betonline.net today, get in on all of the action. BetOnline is where the action starts. 
Hey, want to remind you, once you've made Hitting Hard with John Trucker your first listen every day, make your next listen Locked On Sports today. Check out their podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. They are free and available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast from. So Arthur Smith talking yesterday about we'll know more tomorrow, pretty much about the stats of Cordero Patterson. Now, look, look, he's eligible to come off of IR this week. You've probably seen some of his videos online. He's dragging weights around. He's running. He looks like he's all good to go with everything, right? But the Falcons really do have a good problem because even losing Patterson may be your one, two, three best offensive player that you have on your roster. You look at the contributions that Tyler Algier and Caleb Huntley, plus Mariota as well, and even to a degree, Avery Williams, those guys have more than held up their end of the bargain in the running game. Algier is just a tick below the four yards. He's at 3.9 yards per attempt in the running game, 84 carries for 324 yards. Patterson still leads the team with 340 yards. Huntley's had 57 carries for 265 yards. He's averaging 4.6 yards per carry. Mariota's getting you 5.1 yards per carry. And Avery Williams on his 10 carries, averaging 5.8 yards per carry. So, The good news is, is getting Patterson back. The other good news is you don't have to just push him right in and get him right running the football. I think they're going to kind of slow work him in a little bit in the running game, where I think that you will see the opportunity to get Patterson more involved in is throwing some passes to him. So we talked yesterday about the efficiency in the passing game and how good of a game Arthur and Ragone dialed up in the passing game. Quick, easy throws, one read, go, bop, 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 not spending a lot of time in the pocket, right? Quick decision-making, don't overthink it, read, react, throw, right? That's what you can do with Patterson as well. He can be a valuable asset in the passing game. So if you want Algier and Huntley to do some of the grunt work of banging it inside in the run game, and they'll give Patterson his opportunities as well. It's not like they're not going to feature him at all in the running game. But Arthur Arthur Smith talked about the idea of, A, they'll have a better idea Wednesday, because today's an off day, better idea Wednesday about where they're at. But B, he did say, we're going to kind of work them in. And that's because of the contributions that they've got from Algier and Caleb Huntley. And this is going to be a good problem to have through the rest of the season. You know, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if and when we'll see Damian Williams back playing for the Falcons. Because now you've got three running backs that, you know, plus Avery Williams that are contributing to the running game. So it doesn't feel like you have to rush anybody back off IR or anything like that. Patterson, you want to get back into the mix pretty quickly here. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, maybe it's eight carries or six or eight carries for for Patterson, maybe not more than 10, but let Algier and Huntley do more of that grunt work and then use Patterson in the passing game. Try to get him in some open space. Try to use him there. Mix in a couple of plays on the in the jet sweep, the run game, with an Avery Williams. But this is a really good problem to have. And we looked last year, you know, when it was, we thought Mike Davis and Patterson carrying the load, and Mike Davis really couldn't give a whole lot of contributions. He just you know, three and a half yards of carry, just never could get going in the running game. Huntley really spent last year on the practice squad, didn't really do anything for this team. So seeing Algier, who they drafted out of BYU, seeing Caleb Huntley be a part of all this, we knew Mariota was going to be a part of the running game. But you have to be impressed by the job that Huntley and Algier have done to hold up their end of the bargain in the running game. Now, what does that tell you? Well, one is, obviously, you know, for lack of a better term, if you've been able to plug and play with your running backs, that means your offensive line has played pretty well. And it's not coincidence that the Atlanta Falcons are a top five run blocking graded team in the league. If you look at pro football Focus's grade rankings, the Falcons are fifth in the NFL as far as their run blocking grade goes. Lindstrom has been outstanding this year. Elijah Wilkinson is a huge upgrade at left guard. And while Dolman's had his issues, Jake Matthews has been solid. Even Caleb McGarry has been better this year, and it plays to Caleb McGarry's strengths 
when it comes to the run game. Grab a guy and lock him and hold him up. That's McGarry's strength. And what's going to be interesting, I hate to say this, but be interesting that maybe McGarry's working himself into, eh, we'll talk about that later on in the year as we're, we got to get past the halfway point and everything like that. But the Falcons have a good problem on their hands with what to do in the running game. So you don't have to force him, Patterson, force him back in quickly. You don't have to overload him. And I know he wants to get back. You saw the videos. Like, he's ready and eager to get back. And and he, and he he'll be back. I mean, unless, unless he's had a setback that we don't know about, you know, I expect him to practice tomorrow. I expect him to practice through the rest of the week. You don't have to travel this week either. So that's another good thing is you're staying at home against the Chargers, right? So you're not on the road or anything like that. So he's going to sleep in his own bed all the way up till game time and everything. So this is becoming a good problem of multiple guys in the backfield that they have to find a way to use. And I wonder if it, like I said, if you can get Patterson more involved in the passing game, that's one more guy because look, the way that their passing game is starting to develop, quick, quick throws, quick reads, short routes, you know, get ball in guys' hands and let them go get the yards after catch. We saw that with Pitts. We've seen that with London. And I expect that we'll see that with Patterson as well. So, look, the Falcons will have to make a, a roster move and all that when they activate Patterson. But I would be immensely surprised if they put Huntley back down on the practice squad because let's be honest, you put him on the practice squad, somebody's probably going to go claim him. Somebody's probably going to poach him off of there, off the roster. Because you he's proven that you could put him on a 53-man and he can be effective. You know, he may not be RB1 for a lot of teams, but he can provide an extra spark. And he is getting you over four and a half yards of carry on this year. And he runs tough. He's another tough runner when you watch him run, right? Getting between the tackles, tough running, you know, extra effort, picking up yards. So the Falcons are finding themselves in a really good problematic situation. They've got too many guys to carry the football. Now, how often have we said that over the last handful of years, right? Over the last couple of decades, you know, it was usually one main back and that was it. And you got very little contributions. You know, Jason Snelling was a guy, you know, that you got little bits and pieces here from and this, and the other, but you had Warwick, you moved into the Michael Turner era, then you worked in the Devontae Freeman area. And that was the one stretch when they had Coleman that they felt like they could rely on Freeman and Coleman as sort of a two-headed monster. But even then, you know, Freeman got the majority of the carries. So it'll be interesting to see how they work Patterson back in this coming weekend. I expect him to maybe have about six to eight carries, maybe three or four receptions in the game, get some targets in the passing game, work him back in. But I still think the bulk in the workload is going to be about Algier, Huntley, and Mariota, at least for maybe this week and potentially next week before they full bore get Patterson heavy duty back into being really full-time RB1 out of all of it. I want to talk about my friends over at Built Bar. Listen, head to Built.com today. We're all looking for those low-carb, low-sugar, high-protein snacks, right? We've talked before on the show about the protein-infused marshmallow puffs, right? So if you're looking for something a little bit different or you're looking for that ideal snack with lots of flavor to it, head to Built.com today. Check out their wide menu of different products. I've told you before, I really like the mixed berry. I really like the coconut stuff. I'm, I'm, I enjoy coconut very much. All kinds of flavors, and they're always coming out with a new flavor, a new flavor for the specific month. And, oh, yeah, look at the calendar. We're into November. So expect a new flavor coming out from Built.com. Check out their wide menu of products of Built Bars at Built.com. Try the protein-infused marshmallow puffs. And when you get your order put together through Built.com, when you get to checkout, use the promo code LOCKEDON15, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, the number one, the number five. LOCKEDON15, use that promo code, and you will get 15% off your order simply by using the promo code LOCKEDON15 at checkout. Head to Built.com today. Check out their wide menu of products. Save yourself 15% off that first order and get the snack and the products that you're looking for and you need. So I know there's still been a lot of angst about the idea of that word 
targets, right? When it comes to Cal Pitts, when it comes to Drake London and things like that. So I've said, and go back in the archives, have talked about the idea of, I never thought Kyle Pitts would match his targets and his catches and yards from last year. What I cared about is, how do you find him in the red zone? How do you get more touchdowns to him? London's had a couple of touchdowns. We've seen Pitts now get himself a couple of touchdowns here recently. So look at the trend, okay? I always like to look at numbers and their trend, okay? So in the first four games of the season, the Falcons had six rushing touchdowns and three passing touchdowns. Six rush, three pass, okay? The last four games, they've had three rushing touchdowns and seven passing touchdowns. Now, this is what I'll say about all of this, okay? This this is where I've wanted to see sort of that trend. Not necessarily getting away from pounding the ball in and, and running it into the end zone. But what was always most important about London and Pitts is finding ways to use those guys as they've gotten down deep. Now, I know London hasn't scored in the last four games, right? And we've seen Demir Bird get a couple of touchdowns, you know, right? Zacchaeus and guys like that. But Pitts has gotten himself a couple of touchdowns over the last four game stretch here, right? That's where the difference is. That's where that you have to get your weapons involved in. I will continue to say, I am not worried about targeting Pitts and targeting London all over the field. They're not going to be a huck it around team. This won't be a 560 pass attempt team like they were last year or a 600 pass attempt team like they've averaged over the last four years. We always knew going into this that those attempt numbers would go way down and they'd be toward the bottom of the NFL. But what have we said? The only way your red zone offense is going to get better if that includes Pitts and London. You don't draft those two guys without being able to use those weapons when you get down deep. And I think we're starting to see that little bit of a trend of confidence, play calling, whatever you want to describe it as. One set I thought was was actually rather fascinating. Falcons have nine rushing touchdowns this year. So we're not exactly through the halfway point. There's no real halfway point anymore, right, uh, with, with the 17-game schedule. But the Falcons only had 11 rushing touchdowns on the season last year. Yeesh. You know, not a not a not a great number by any stretch of the imagination, right? They have nine already this year. So you're seeing the evolution of this offense. Again, we talked about yesterday the passing game, how it's developing, how they're getting Mariota in putting him in situations where he's more comfortable. Also, they're going to play certain situational football, right? We talked about yesterday. They were down, you know, with three minutes to go in that game. The, the touchdown drive that, you know, was Demir Bird catching that pass and running it in on the touchdown pass. Well, that was a drive that was no runs incorporated in all that. So we're seeing this offense evolve and get to where that you figure in the next few weeks, especially as we get down the home stretch and hopefully – are talking about, you know, trying to make a playoff run in this, that, and the other, that that balance is there, and you'll see the weapons get used. Look, I don't care, honestly, if Pitts and London end up with 40 catches each if they both have six to eight touchdowns apiece, right? And, and again, go back in the archives. I talked about this. I don't care about Pitts's – that's why the whole 1,000-yard thing last year didn't impress me at all. I don't – I mean – a thousand yards and only one touchdown is not massively impactful. Sorry, it's just not. Like that's that's not that's not making a big impact on the game and, and winning football. But even if it's 40 catches and 700 yards, but they both have six or eight touchdowns to go along with it, okay. Now we're now we're talking. And you're starting to see that that passing game, you know, over the last four games and how the touchdown passes are going up, the rushing touchdowns are coming down, not because that they've gotten away from the run, but there's that confidence building in being able to throw the football when you get down deep. And this is going to be about, part of this is going to be 
Arthur Smith having confidence in his quarterback to not make any bad decisions and to not put the ball in harm's way when they get down there. Because again, I don't want to hear about, you know, well, our guys getting double teamed. Every top player, you don't think Diggs and Jefferson and all these guys and Jamar, you don't think the Chase and all, you don't think all those guys get double teamed? You think that's unique to Drake London or Kyle Pitts that they're the only two guys in the NFL that get double teamed when they get down deep? Of course not. But it's about finding a way to either scheme them open or the quarterback having trust to put it up and go get those guys. And Mariota's talked about that the last couple of weeks about, uh, he said, you know, saying, quote, I have to find those guys. I have to continue to build trust and find those guys. I have to believe in putting the ball up to those guys and those guys making a play. So I'm not worried about overall targets. You know, I know a lot of the fantasy football people. I could care less about those morons. Okay. I could care less what your fantasy team does. I'm trying to win football games. And if I'm trying to win football games, I do have to figure out London and Pitts when we get down deep into it. They can't become, I can't sit here and brag about they're blocking in the red zone or them being decoys in the red zone. I have to have those two guys be weapons and targets when I get down deep. You saw a few weeks ago, Kelsey for Kansas City. What do you have? Three touchdowns with 25 total yards? I could care less about him having four catches for 25 yards. Those three touchdowns that he had are what matters most. That's why they won the game. They didn't win the game because they had four catches for 25 yards. They won the game because he scored three touchdowns. So if that's where Pitts and London can get their effectiveness, sign me up. And I think we're moving that direction. You know, you've seen them be able to scheme Pitts on some one-on-one -on -one situations when they get down deep. That first touchdown that he scored, right? Quick little boop, bop, you know, and th one throw, react, throw it to him. Get it into his hands. Mariota last week in that game, right? Had Pitts read all the way. Give Pitts a second to shed his block, throw it to him. Get it up to him. And, and they did that earlier in the year with Drake London, right? London's first touchdown. Quick, one read, throw it. That's it. So I don't care about the rest of all the stats or where they head or this, that, and the other. You know, tell me what their touchdown production is going to be. And as you can see, and as we just explained, you know, as they're getting some more passing touchdowns in this offense, as they're starting to have some trust and open it up a little bit, that's where those two guys now, we can feel like that they reach more of their full potential, right? Don't focus on targets. Focus on what am I getting when we're going down deep in their offensive sets. All right, we thank you so much for making Hit Hard with John Chuckery your first listen every day. Don't forget, we want you to make Locked On Sports today that second listen, the biggest stories of the day, instant reactions, big games, recaps and the take of the day you can find them on the odyssey app youtube wherever you get your podcast from and of course head to youtube.com put locked on sports landing in hit the subscribe button leave us a comment don't forget free and available odyssey spotify any of your favorite podcast platforms you can download us for free leave us a five-star review roku and amazon fire yes we are available now on those platforms hit us up there and then follow me at jmch Three one six. Back with you for a hump day edition tomorrow. This has been hitting hard with John Chuckery, locked on Sports Atlanta.